Hi, everyone. It's Willie Crawford. Uh, I am uh, welcoming you to the Modern Midas podcast, which is designed not to make you, not to give you the Midas touch necessarily, but to teach you ways to make and save money and invest more wisely and things like that. Today, I'm joined by a very, very good friend, uh, Eva Rosenberg, who uh, whose book I have in front of me here, uh, Small Business Taxes Made Easy. That was uh, one of her books. Um, she also wrote one called uh, Deduct Everything that I had the honor of uh, looking at a, a, a pre-release version of and, and giving a little blurb in it. So uh, Eva and I go back quite a while. Eva, and I'm reading now, Eva Rosenberg is an enrolled agent. She's a best-selling author and the internet marketing tax, uh, tax mama, internet tax mama. Uh, and that's a registered trademark. <laughs> She created the free taxmama.com website to answer tax questions for free, ideally before folks take major financial steps. Why? Because she got tired of fixing all the problems people have generated uh, by acting first and asking later, which is my uh, false. Eva teaches a special six month course on uh, to train tax professionals how to uh, represent clients like you and I before the IRS. And uh, with that, uh, Eva, thank you for taking time out of your, I know, very busy schedule as we enter tax season to, to join me today. Well, thank you so much, Willie. I mean, I really appreciate it. Uh, I know you have the most amazing audience of people involved working on the internet, affiliate marketing, and selling all kinds of stuff very much online, you know, including things, you know, like your recipe books and stuff. People people get into this stuff. And the internet has become really like the Wild West where people can start anything and either become dramatically wealthy or lose everything because they don't take sensible precautions and act like a business. Mm. I mean, how many yeah. times have you seen people get a bunch of venture capital money, like five or 10 million, and then waste it all in a year or so and not use it well? Yeah, I, so, I, I, I've seen that quite a bit. And I've, I have friends who've been uh, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, some to the IRS, which we'll get into a little bit later on, because uh, I'd like to touch on the issue myself. I, uh, quite frankly, have had the IRS in the past email me a bill for $180,000 in back taxes. I, uh, I reached out to the contact phone number in the uh, email and mm -hmm. said, you know, what? I, what? I didn't use very polite language, <laughs> but uh, the lady on the other end said, you're, first of all, you work for the government, you're military, so you should understand, you know, proper record keeping and all that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we can work this out. And, uh, but it was, my problem was not proper record keeping. Um, but let's start with, uh, you know, I mentioned that you're an enrolled agent with the RS. Why don't we uh, start with you explaining what an enrolled agent is? That's great. Thank you very much. Um, enrolled agents are probably the best kept secrets in the tax industry. Everybody knows about CPAs. They've got great press. Hardly anyone knows about EAs. And we were actually created before CPAs. We were created after the Civil War um, by the U.S. government because people were making claims for uh, donkeys or, or horses that that had been confiscated by the military and so forth and they're getting their reparations and apparently there were more of those claims than there existed horses or donkeys in the world so they created this group of people to do verification on some of these claims and at the time there actually was a role and so they're enrolled agents and now we are the highest credential that the IRS offers for any tax professional and Enrolled agents are specifically trained to deal with taxes and with IRS problems. And um, this is something a lot of other tax professionals don't have the training to do. So to become an EA, you have to pass three very tough IRS exams. And most people without the training and experience couldn't pass those exams. 
Okay. And, and when I heard, you know, special agent or enrolled agent, I, I immediately flashed back to James West and Artemis Garden on the Wild Wild West. <laughs> and especially she mentioned the Wild West, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, but I, I don't have those disguises that Artemis has. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they were, they were awesome. And I, I, I didn't fully, I watched that as a child and I didn't fully get what the Wild Wild West was all about. But uh, why don't we, uh, Look at the. We look at why small business owners should work with an enrolled agent for their tax needs. You know, uh, a lot of us think that we can. I don't know. Read the tax forms and figure them out on our, on our own. <laughs> we can't. Uh, yeah, really. It, it looks like it could be easy. And let's face it, just about everything you need to know is available online. But the everything that you need to know that is available online consists of millions of pages, millions of words that, sure, you can find information, but it could be the wrong information. It could mm -hmm. be incomplete information. And I've had so many people come to me who were running their business. They they refused to invest in, in counseling or advice, and they've done things that well, either they haven't done things that they should have that would have saved them thousands of dollars, or they've done things because somebody at standing in line at the grocery store or something or some internet website told them to do, and they're facing fraudulent uh, tax charges and so forth. So there's a lot of really bad information out there, and it's important to work with somebody who's trained. You know, we have to take classes every year specifically mm -hmm. in tax to keep up with what's going on and you know the tax the, the whole tax environment is, is like quicksand you know it's under your feet and it's changing all the time if you are not taking classes and keeping up there's no way you could be doing somebody's tax return professionally and get paid for it yeah i i've noticed that with every successive uh, uh political administration or whatever the rules change. Uh, a lot of it is just governments trying to figure out how to maximize, first of all, the tax revenue they collect. And, and when COVID shut down the economy, uh, I noticed they got more aggressive on uh, going after people who owed back taxes even. Uh, you know, I, I have friends who, who you know, were threatened uh, with uh, owing back tax they hadn't paid yet and i know one friend who they threatened to pull his passport so he couldn't even travel i'm like whoa the irs has that authority uh it's pretty powerful the irs got that authority and for them to be doing that the person has not filed tax return or has filed tax returns and owes money, has ignored all of the notices, hasn't mm. responded, hasn't paid over $50,000, and that's been escalating. I think now it's up to 55000 So they've made no effort whatsoever to pay anything or to engage with the IRS. And when they reach that point, IRS certifies them to the State Department and they lose their passport. Absolutely. Wow. Now, ask me if I have sympathy. Well, well, most people don't realize that in practically every modern society, we're not free people. We belong to the state. I mean, when we get a birth certificate, it certifies that we belong to the state. Sort and, of. Uh, sort of, yeah. And so it, it's... it's uh, a pet peeve of mine, but uh, well, hey, they paid your salary for years when you were in the yes. military. Yes. They provide bridges and roads and utilities and you know water systems and aqueducts and all kinds of things. That money has to come from somewhere. Yeah. I know that we don't all agree with how they spend the money. I mean, there's no question about that. But in a civilized society, we can't each pay for those things individually. We've no. got to put them into a pot and have and try trust that the people we elect are going to use that wisely, not always so wisely. But the problem is with these particular kinds of people is, why aren't they opening their mail? Why aren't they responding at all? I mean, mm. if you're if you're constantly reaching out to somebody and they ignore you, how do you feel? 
you know, you're going to get you're going to get aggressive about them. And so those people who have ignored everything and oh, so much money, um, they probably can afford to pay it. These are a lot of people who are very famous people who are in the industry and in the media and so forth. They've got a ton of money and they're just not bothering or they don't realize their managers aren't taking care of this for them and they're being ripped off. Mm. A lot of that mm. happens. And I've seen the IRS bend over backwards for these people who have, you know, international tours and stuff and help them get their passports and get back on track. And to get back on track, they actually have to set up an installment plan and start working on paying the money back. So it can be done. We do that all the time. I, I, uh, I come across lots of people on social media who advertise and say, you know, if you owe more than $10,000 or $100,000 to the IRS, you know, we can help you. Are those people that you should engage with or should they be more looking to engage with somebody like you, an, an ER, an EA credentialed individual? Well, those companies uh, usually have a team of enrolled agents or CPAs mm -hmm. or attorneys. In fact, there was one company that was all attorneys that was doing this and they were very legitimate, but they realized that when the IRS sees an attorney on a power of attorney rather than an enrolled agent, uh, they think that there's criminal action going on. So I had this whole firm of about 30 attorneys come to me to teach them how to pass the EA exam so they could use enrolled agent on their power of attorney instead of attorney so the IRS doesn't see that this might be a criminal matter. So many of those companies are legitimate and you know, if you look at who's running them and who the people are, they are already enrolled agents. But you probably get a little bit of better service if you're working with your enrolled agent who is working with you personally. Mm -hmm. What's the one big problem we have run into with people who owe a ton of money like this and why they are so angry with the companies they hire? You're not going to like this. We go through the whole list of things that we need to get from them in order to put in what we call an offer and compromise so that the IRS will understand that they can't afford to pay it. And that requires very often three months worth of records. And so they'll start filtering some of that stuff in a little bit at a time. And then by the time we get the last thing we need, it's six months down the road, we've got to start over because we can't send that in because it needs to be the most recent three months. And the biggest problem we have is babysitting these people. And then they get mad because they've eaten up the billable time by wasting the time and the time is used up and now they have to pay again. A lot of people are really responsible and we can help them very easily, but other times something that should take us a few months to take care of will take years because the client isn't cooperative and it breaks my heart when that happens. Now, I, I, uh, I know people who, for various reasons, various screw-ups, uh, uh, don't have records that go back and cover the year that the RF <laughs> is asking for. You know, I, I know one person who had his record stored in a uh, self-storage unit, and <laughs> they got so behind on their, their bill payments mm -hmm. that the self-storage unit auctioned off <laughs> the place they had all their records. So, you know, oh what my is the God. Like do? You know, it's like... <gasps> Oh, my God. I mean, some, somebody got their personal records. I mean, that's scary as heck. Well, then you, then you go in and you, you change a lot of things that, that can be taken advantage of. But, yeah, somebody could have. Somebody got their, their records. Personal records at auction, yes. Yeah, that is um, scary. So don't. So first thing, don't do that. OK, you know, folks, don't leave stuff someplace and then don't pay your fees. You know, the storage fees are either that or at least get your personal records out. But no, that's one of the things that I've been doing for most of my career is helping reconstruct records for people who mm -hmm. haven't filed for years. So many small business people. Uh, work out of the seat of their pants. They don't keep records. You know, they just, they don't even know how much they've deposited into the bank or anything. Some of them don't even have bank accounts. You know, they're, they're working with PayPal or something. And it originally PayPal would only give you three months worth of information and it wasn't easy. So 
that's why the first the first thing I want to say is people act like adults. Put on your big boy panties, even if you're a girl, and start keeping good records. And if you don't want to do it, hire someone to do it for you. Mm -hmm. It is going to make the difference between the success and failure of your business 100% guaranteed. And, uh, you know, uh, we're all taught that you should separate personal finances from business finances. So definitely have a separate business account, uh, whether it's an LLC or S or C Corp or whatever. Uh, and uh, yet uh, some people don't even do that. So those people, where do they start separating records? You know, that's such a great point. And it's oh. one of my pet fees. Yeah. You know, you you set up a business. And at first, maybe you don't realize it's a business because you're just kind of doing something as a hobby. But now it's starting to make money. Wake up, treat it as a business, open the separate bank account, keep a separate set of books, separate the stuff out. And ideally, now that you see that this may be developing into a real business, which happens quickly on the Internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we've known people who were kids who started something and Six or eight months later, they developed, for instance, a really good autoresponder system and became millionaires. Mm. Not that I'm going to mention anybody's name, but I think he was 16 at the time out of his father's basement. Um, mm. it, you know, you, you, you know what I'm the talking about. Bay Weber, was it? We're not going to say that, right? <laughs> uh -huh. No, because I use them and, and it's the most reliable autoresponder system that I've come across for the money. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we won't say that. We won't say that he was my client way back then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, you start seeing that you're developing a business before you even open a bank account for the business itself. You really need to do a little bit of business planning. And, you know, one of the things I recommend is a short term plan. What do you want to get out of it right now? And what do you want to do long term? How do you want it to grow? Do you want it to ultimately go public? Do you want to be selling it? Do you want someone to take it over? How are you going to exit? So you do these things. That's going to give you an idea of what kind of entity your business should be, whether it should be an LLC, a partnership, corporation, or whatever. Once you know that and you file for that entity, then you open a bank account because a bank account is tied to the nature of the entity. So I know a lot of people open the bank account first, and then now uh, they've gone and picked up an entity, and now the bank, and it has a different federal tax ID number, now they've got to open another bank account. Mm -hmm. You know, so so that's you know putting putting the cart before before the donkey or whatever. I'm I'm, I'm on donkeys today apparently, yeah. Um, but yeah, if if you do that, if you do the planning and understand where you're going first, and you start setting this up, and you turn it over to someone to do the accounting, because I know people in sales and creative people are terrible at record keeping. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Don't do the things you don't want to do. Pay somebody who loves to do those things and it'll get done right. And you're going to be literally richer for the experience. Yeah, it's, it seems like the record keeping requirement, the day to day bookkeeping can be overwhelming. It's like you need to spend so many hours, you know, just tracking things. Uh, if you, you travel as a part of a business experience. Everything that you buy and sell, the inventory and all that tracking seems uh, seems like such a headache that a lot of people don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why bother? Right. Why bother? Sure. Okay. Let me tell you about why bother. I had a client who was an entertainer, spent a lot of time on cruise ships for most of the mm -hmm. year. And when I asked him how much his out-of-pocket expenses were, you know, for out-of-pocket travel tips and so forth, he'd look up at my ceiling and I think 5,322, because we don't like proud numbers. Mm -hmm. I challenged him one year, okay? You keep records. Keep records for one year and tell me what your real expenses are. And he used something called expensable at the time. And he went through that for the whole year, the tips, the shuttles and everything and the dry cleaning for his wardrobe, the material for his music and everything over $15,000. Wow. 
That's the difference between keeping records and just making it up. Also, you do that. And if you're ever audited, everything is there. And you know what? These days, it's so easy. All right. You have these days, everybody's got a phone. It's got a camera. You can snap these pictures and either send them to your accountant, put them directly into QuickBooks, or there's a company mm -hmm. called Zero XERO. Use these accounting systems. You can put it directly into there and it will take care of itself. Or you use something called shoebox.com and send them everything and they'll organize it. They'll work with your accountant to get it organized in a way that works. So it's easy. You know, unlike me, everybody else has a phone that, that will snap pictures and store data and transmit it. I can never get it to transmit. I'm still trying to mm -hmm. get it to transmit the pictures of the of the rose tree in my front yard, in my backyard here. <laughs> I've got to get a new phone. I, I'm fairly techy, uh, but I, I wonder at times, you know, what is the best bookkeeping system? I, I guess that the person should start with their professional tax advisor or accountant and, and see what they recommend or what works best for the, the uh, professional they work with. Yeah, ideally find the professional you're going to work with, find out what they are using because they're already working with it. A lot of people these days are working with systems that are online. So mm -hmm. that lets you enter data and they can enter data without shutting you down for a few weeks while they reconcile it now. Um, you can call them and, and have your accountant look and see what's going on. You think you're having a problem. They can log in with you or without you. They can pull the records to do quarterly reports, tax returns, you know, payroll things, whatever. They can do that for you. And I think the two main affordable systems that are, you know, full-blown accounting systems are QuickBooks and Xero. Mm, and that's XERO. Not 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 Z E R O, but X E R O. There are others, you know, and there are there are versions that are very very high end uh, that will also integrate, you know, your whole inventory supply and stuff like that. But if you've got a really complex business, let your accountant set it up for you. And again, ideally online, so that so that you can log in and do it they can log in at the same time and they can do things without having to stop your business so, and, so you know I, I work a lot with and people like me who started their business i, I wrote a cookbook and i started selling yeah. that and and it took off and and then all of a sudden i said well gee i need an llc for asset protection and uh, then i read somewhere that if you did an s core or a c core and you hired other people, you could give them tax benefits, such as you could finance their education or whatever. So you could do all kinds of magical mm -hmm. things. Uh, and then I came across you and I read your book, uh, Deduct Everything, which said that if you properly track your records, everything could be a business expense, you know? Well, not everything, but most things, you know, you have to make them legitimate. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, and then that brings me to another question, which is, I operated out of my home for the longest time. So how do you separate home expenses from business expenses? Okay, it depends a lot. If you have a separate area, a completely separate area or separate mm -hmm. room that you're using for business, that's important. Mm -hmm. If you don't actually have a room and you just designate an area that you use exclusively for the desk, the computer, and the whole bit, you can pick up that area. Let's say it's 100 square feet out of a out of a 2,000 square foot home. You're going to get that ratio. If mm -hmm. you're using your dining room table and you know then you put everything away when the family wants to eat you don't have a business location you don't have an office and home so a lot of it is is having a completely separate and distinct area you know like if you have a room and you also have a couch in there and you use it as a guest room the part of the room that is not you know that is used as a guest room is never going to be your exclusive business use so some people actually have a separate structure next to the house hmm. so they may also have that and be able to use that as but they have to they have to be able to do a schematic of you know what it looks like compared to the house what the square footage is and it's a good idea to take pictures uh, for mm -hmm. instance I had a client who was a, a costume designer for the film industry 
and he had a small apartment and like he was all over the place everything was er everywhere and he was making costumes and everything else and you know i told him you you need to designate one area so he like, took like half the house and just set it off aside half the apartment and and had everything spread out I told him take pictures take pictures now when he got audited it was two years later and he wasn't living there but we had the pictures to prove what it was like for the year that was being audited. So that's why I recommend pictures, because by the time you get audited, you may not be using that room if they come and look at you, for, you know, which is not very likely, or you may not even be using that house or that apartment anymore. Pictures, video, that's okay, video is good now that you can do that with your phone. I mean, the phones are magic now. A new phone now they are. <laughs> is gonna cost me more than my computer. And has more computer power than computing power than probably some NASA rockets had back in the day. Exactly. Uh, then, then, then it took to go to the moon, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I totally appreciate that. You know, uh, a lot of my audience is small business owners who just start something out of their home or whatever. And um, I don't know. First of all, they fear the IRS. I don't think, as, as a retired soldier, I don't think I should fear my government. So I don't. Uh, but I know they have a lot of power at the same time, a lot of authority. So uh, what is some of the best tax advice you can give to a small business owner, you know? Well, tell the truth, okay? Yeah, definitely mm. the, the best advice, absolutely, is to have decent records. Mm. Um, no, no, set up a business plan. We talked about the business plan. One of the tax benefits of the business plan is if things start going wrong and you end up with losses, mm. especially in the first couple of years where you weren't really anticipating them, you have proof that you had a profit motive and a business intent. And that's going to make all the difference between keeping those losses and losing those losses. That's one of my favorite things is, is hobby loss audits and proving mm. that people actually had to win every one of those. Um, what is it? If you don't make a profit in the first X number of years, then they view it as a hobby? They do. So two mm -hmm. years out of five, you know, if you don't make a profit for for three years, you can lose money for two years out of five. After mm -hmm. that, they're looking at it as a hobby mm -hmm. unless you can prove, okay? For instance, I had a guy who raised horses and he was losing money and he was losing money for several years. And I was able to prove to the IRS that he had a business plan. He had a profit motive and the primary breeding horse that he had been raising um, got ill and died. And so that changed a profitable year would otherwise would have been a profitable year into a loss. And, you know, we were able to prove to the IRS, even though there were four years worth of losses, that mm. this really was a business and he was planning on building it so that he could retire on the ranch. Because that's the other problem. You know, when you have someone who makes a lot of money on a W-2 job and they're taking losses on a Schedule C, that's very instantly suspicious to the mm. IRS as it's a personal hobby and you're writing it off. And so I was able to prove that this was designed to be a business so that when he left his $200,000 a year job, he was going to be running the ranch. So, yeah, okay. that's that's where the business plan becomes so important. So, so the, first of all, the, the um, person starting a business needs to start working with a professional and you recommend EAs. When you're dealing with taxes, it really helps to work with an enrolled agent. I mean, I've seen people work with attorneys and the attorneys may recommend a, let's say they may recommend you need to get an LLC, for instance. Do you know what an LLC is? It limits liability to just that business and separates, no. It's nothing. It's, it's a box. So for tax purposes, an LLC is nothing. You know, how are you going to report that? Are you going to report that as a sole proprietorship? Are you going to report it as a partnership, an S corporation or a C corporation? Just having the LLC is meaningless. And for instance, there is a very, very special provision that if you set up a C corporation and it's not a service business, but it you have products or other things like a school. Mm -hmm. um, if you hold that stock, it's a small business corporation, you hold that stock for five years or more and then sell it, almost 100% of your profits are tax-free. 
but it has to start life as a C corporation. Mm -hmm. So somebody was just writing, you know, I have a client who started an LLC and he wants to turn this into a small business corporation and, and make it a schedule, make it a C corporation. He can't do that. He has to close the LLC and start a whole new company to do that. So that's why just picking an entity out of thin air is cool. By the way, you said that the LLC protects you from liability. It I'm doesn't. Liability. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It may protect you against uh, some of the loans and things like that. Your personal assets may be protected from loans unless you guaranteed, you know, co-signed on the loan for the business. But if you're doing something and you're performing a service and you're the one doing it and something goes wrong and someone gets harmed, they're not just going to sue the business. They're going to sue you personally. Mm. So having an LLC isn't going to protect you from personal liability if it's something you've done or were responsible for overseeing someone else who was doing it. Mm. What is going to protect you? A decent liability policy. Mm. You know, An so insurance policy. Yeah. So the much better than an LLC for protection is getting decent liability insurance. And if you have a lot of assets, then getting one of those umbrella policies to cover the difference between what the liability insurance covers and the rest of your assets. Then if you're sued, you're not going to lose your home. See, I, I was trained by an asset protection lawyer who taught me that if you go to a hotel anywhere and, and you slip and fall on the floor and you sue the hotel, the hotel owner isn't responsible as the people operating the hotel because they pass that off, you know, to someone else. And so it, it, it taught me how to shift liability. It taught me, you know, <laughs> even if I bought a car, maybe I want to buy it in, in the name of a separate entity. So if I get in a wreck, I can't be sued for my personal liability, my personal assets. Um, and and uh, so that's getting off and I know but but that's but that's an interesting trade-off and and you know when you're talking about the Hilton hotel chain yeah right and they are contracted out with you know a million hotels yeah. they the chain itself is going to get protected and it's going to be on the manager there on premises you're mm -hmm. talking about a small hotel owned by a, a person not, not some a major answer. entity. Yeah, no, not some major entity. And they're on the premises and they're overseeing stuff. They're going to get sued personally. I can't tell you how many times I have gone after people for one reason or another who thought they were protected. And I sued them in addition. And mostly this is small claims court. And it blew their minds that they mm -hmm. lost and had to pay personally. Uh -huh. So, you know, no. I, I, pra I practice what I preach. And by the way, guys, do not stiff your tax professional. They know where your assets are. When they win the lawsuit, they know how to collect. There are a lot of people who are arrogant <laughs> and think, you know, oh, yeah, sue me and then see if you can get the money. Well, we know where it is. So, yeah. Uh, see, I I'm a member of a, a mastermind group, uh, mostly uh, millionaires, a couple billionaires, and they look at asset protection and they look at offshore accounts. And I mean, we've got people from China and Russia and all over the US who have stuff hidden away in the Caribbean. And uh, they look at uh, tax havens, you know, places the IRS chooses to be hands off for a while. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I deal with a lot of people like that. And uh, I'm surprised that I'm not a billionaire after having spent 30 years around these people, but uh, I'm not. Uh, but I, I do okay. Um, you have enough. Enough is always good. Enough is always good. I I, uh, I like hanging out around in-laws in the Philippines, uh, which is a former U.S. province and sort of impoverished, a uh, U.S. Uh, colony, and it's sort of impoverished. But uh, I'm building a house there at the end of the year. So, so what are some of the other big mistakes that you see small businesses making well speaking of offshore <laughs> <laughs> by the way offshore includes canada and mexico so it's not it's not just another island but 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 i will joke with my canadian friends and say canada is just another u.s province <laughs> 
Yeah, it's you know, it's like Las Vegas is just a suburb of of Los of Los Angeles, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's the same kind of concept. But um, when you have accounts outside of the United States and there is ten thousand dollars or more in that account, even for a second during the year, you have to file something called an FBAR. It's a financial report you send into the U.S. Treasury every single year, mm. listing all of those accounts that you have outside the United States. They have to be reported. There's no cost to do this, but the penalty for not reporting it is $10,000. So all of those people with those offshore accounts, and there was just a a Supreme Court case actually where somebody uh, I think went to Romania and he had 272 accounts that he didn't Mm -hmm. report. And um, the IRS tried to to charge him 272 times $10,000, one $10,000 penalty for each account per year. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, you only get to do 10,000 per year, not per account. So that was a major win for people with offshore money. So maybe they can afford to throw away the $10,000 penalty and not let the IRS know where where their accounts are. So, you know, that's that's okay. But I, I'm sorry, you asked another question. What was the question? <laughs> uh, uh... I don't remember, but I'm just looking at offshore assets and assets in general, and I look at the internet, and I look at the fact that the internet was designed by the United States government, DARPA and all those agencies. Mm-hmm. They see everything that you're doing, so you cannot hide anything, you know? Would you agree with that statement? A lot. Uh, you know, people, and this is one of the things that I... I kind find kind of sadly amusing you know people will will lie about the amount of their income on their tax returns and for instance you know people are very public you know you're looking at at film producers Mm -hmm. and they'll show that their film made this much money but on the internet they're saying the film sales were this much money do you think the irs does not see that Okay. Now, they're not looking for this, but when they're going to do an audit, they're going to look for these things. And, you know, if they look at somebody and they're going to audit someone and they think that there's something wrong, they're not just going to look at the records and pull DMV to see what kind of assets they have or pull credit reports to see some of those things. They're going to look at social media. And they're going mm-hmm. to see what people post in social media, you know, so somebody who is you know, posting pure, you know, saying they're, they're poor on their tax returns, but on social media, they're showing their trips, you know, staying at four star hotels and things like that. That's a serious contradiction. Why are you being so public about what you're lying to the IRS about? Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and I, I, uh, I'm not sure where to take this conversation next. You know, um, again, I've, I've mentioned your book, uh, Small Business Taxes Made Easy. Is that the most recent book you've published? Well, it is, but it's the wrong, the wrong edition. So uh, this is this is the most recent edition. Okay. Right. Here we go. It's purple there we now. Go. Yeah. But it's also two years out of date and. Mm. Uh, the tax laws have changed significantly since that was published in, I think, 2021. Mm, things wow. things move Two very quickly. Yeah, but you know what? The tax part of it is out of date, but the book really isn't about taxes. The book is about how to make a business successful and mm. how, to, how to keep records and how to... One of the things that I like to do with, with clients and a good tax professional will do this is review what you're doing uh, like on a quarterly basis and see if you need to change your pricing, see if you need to change your product mix, you know, and, and look at what's going on to become more profitable. I mean, I've, I had one client who was producing socks, mm. producing socks in Turkey. Okay. Mm. And, you know, he was making money, had a couple of million dollars, you know, in sales and so forth, but he had all of this accounts receivable. Mm. And so he couldn't use that money for more production because it was accounts receivable. And so I explained to him about factoring, that's accounts receivable financing, where you can basically sell your accounts receivable to someone, they'll give you like 80 or 90% of the money now, they'll collect 
the bills. You don't have to do the collection. You get money now. And when he did that and had the money for more production, he was able to go from two million to ten million in one year. Wow. Wow. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that an accountant will know, or they'll know, have a contact for you for banking. I had a client who whose bookkeeper was an alcoholic and didn't pay all the payroll taxes, mm -hmm. and she owed $50,000, and she needed to pay it now. I had a friend in, in banking, got her a new business account with that $50,000 that she could pay it off. These are things your accountants have, have contacts. They also have other clients who may become your clients or may become your vendors. They can, they can be your, your network for a lot of different things that you're wasting by not going to somebody in your own industry. Now, now to play devil's advocate, uh, most accountants are trained to be conservative. Uh, so, you know, uh, they won't encourage you to, to do things that are on the edge or dicey. You know, um, and if you're the type of person who wants to invest more aggressively in growing your business, uh, should they not listen to their accountant? It depends. And that's a really, really good point. So you need to find somebody who has your same philosophy. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much about being aggressive as about being legal. There are sometimes things where it's, it's a gray area. And I'm going to look at that. And am I willing to fight that as, as far as the tax court to win that particular case? Or do I think it's not worth it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a trade off. And I will advise my clients, you know, if you do this, understand that you're going to be prepared to be audited. And, you know, I'm prepared to handle the audit, not a problem. But if you're doing this other thing that is completely illegal, I'm gone. I, I sent a client of mine away last year because she was going to do something that I could not agree with. She'll probably come back to me, but I could not do anything for her last year because I didn't agree with what she wanted to do. That makes sense. You know, so for instance, right now, I'm fighting a battle and I'm trying to change the law, actually. Um, it's this isn't court isn't going to help me. Um, one of my clients was hit with a romance scam, $400,000. Mm. And it's not bad enough that he got $400,000 from her and that he, she mortgaged her house and gave him most of the equity. She pulled mm. all of her retirement account money out, which means not only did she lose $400,000, now she has to pay tax on about $200,000 that she doesn't actually have. And so now she's got to pay that tax and there's no deduction for casualty or theft losses right now under the Trump Tax Act unless it's a presidentially declared disaster area. Hmm. So she can't get a tax deduction for this $400,000 theft. And there is that provision that came about as part of the Trump Tax Act. There's this one paragraph I am trying to get removed from the law and I'm trying to work with legislators. I'm trying to work with the IRS and the taxpayer advocate and anybody I can find to help me get that removed from the law retroactively to 2018. So that's that's my campaign right now where I think that I'm going to be able to get that for her. And in the meantime, I'm going to do an offer and compromise for her so that she doesn't have to pay that, even if she could afford it, because it's not a righteous tax. OK, that makes perfect sense. Now, um, people are going to listen to this interview and they're going to think, OK, so who do I need to reach out to 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 get advisor help, uh, accounting, tax advisor help and things like that? Um, do you have a, a channel that they can reach out through? to, to uh, people that you recommend? They can always come to taxmama.com, post questions, ask me if there's somebody I know that I can recommend to them. I will. I think what I would do is start with my particular community of similar professionals, similar business okay. owners, and find out who they're using that is ethical and working sensibly for them that is helping them keep their taxes the lowest legally possible, but also keeping them out of trouble. So mm, that's, that's where I would start is who do, who are you, who do your friends already know? 
I uh, I maybe pushed the envelope a little too much. Uh, I, I when I was a, a an undergrad in college, uh, I had an economics professor who pointed to me pointed me out uh, pointed to me uh, Judge Leonard Han, and, and Judge Han uh, issued a ruling that said we have a legal obligation to pay the taxes that are due, but not yeah. a penny more. You know, They're basically. extracted obligations, but no man uh, has the has requirement to pay anything that uh, is not due. Absolutely, every every sensible accountant has that quote on their wall. Oh, okay, <laughs> I just love that because it said me too. <laughs> said uh, you know, I need to look for legal tax deductions, and, and uh, it's it's my duty to to my business and to my uh, supporters and and customers. So. Uh, you know, um, I, that's one of the reasons I said I don't fear the IRS because uh, they work for us. They do. And believe it or not, it's a different agency than it used to be 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I know there are still some old timers who are very set and who are hostile and angry. But most of the people that I have come into contact with, and there are a lot of people mm -hmm. at the IRS, um, want, to, want to actually help. I know you're going to find this hard to believe. They really do want to help. And if you give them useful information and you treat them with courtesy, even if you're angry with them, mm -hmm. treat them with courtesy they're probably going to find a way to help. And, and one of the things that I do, you know, honestly is, look, you know, this may be an area I don't know something about, I'll tell them, maybe you can help me get this right. Don't preach at them. One of the, one of the problems that a, a, an auditor told me, she was fuming when I came in. She was so angry. She was a, said a CPA had just left and he had browbeaten her, talked down to her, told her how to do her job. He was absolutely nasty to her. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, his client was actually the son of a fam famous actor. And mm -hmm. she felt really sorry for the client because if the client had come in on his own, she'd have been able to help him. But because of the CPA's real nastiness, she had to back up and stick to her guns and stick to the rules. And she wasn't able to help. And, you know, the guy went out mad because he was obnoxious and she was still, yeah, you know, we, we had to get her some tea to get her calmed down before mm, she worked uh, on my case. <laughs> I I, uh, I was once friends with a billionaire who owned, I don't know, 30 to 40 radio stations in the United States. And uh, he had an order to come in uh, to his office. And he told the auditor, go away and send your boss, you know, and he, he was that uh, assertive. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know where he, what he's doing right now, but uh, he, he's outside the U.S., but he has property in the U.S. And uh, uh, actually, I should track him down and figure out what's going with him. Uh, we've gone for uh, close to an hour now. I, I don't want to drag it on any longer than I need to. I do want to encourage people to check out what you're doing. I appreciate your time. Uh, so taxmama.com is the best place for them to check you out. Absolutely. Come to taxmama.com. On the very top of the page, there's a link to ask a question. Post the question. I answer first thing in the morning. Do not email me your questions. I will not answer. I promise mm -hmm. you I will not answer. I'm, I'm not enabling people. But if you come to the website and use the forum in the website, I guarantee you, you will get an answer and some amount of help if I can. And, and basically, uh, when you do that, you're also making it useful to not just yourself, but to other people. And, and uh, you know, we all have to leverage our time. And, and so if we can get a question that uh, benefits more than just you, uh, naturally it makes sense to respond to that. Um, yeah, but don't put don't put private information in there. It is a public website, even though you have to register and log in. IRS has access to it. Ooh. So seriously, you know, be circumspect in what you in what specific information you ask. I find myself having to edit out several questions with too much information. Oh, TMI. And, and, and <laughs> yes. that's that's true of all social media. You know, uh, it's stored in a public database that somewhere could come back and bite you. So uh, be careful what you post online. And, and there are lots of frauds out there too. Uh, yes. 
Uh, there's people always reaching out to you, offering to help you, uh, but uh, you should not enter private information in most public forums. Uh, even my bank, you know, will tell me, you know, we will never ask you for these bits of data, you know. Uh, so you got to protect yourself. Um, I, I want to thank you for uh, for taking time out of your, your busy day, Eva. I, I really uh, I love and appreciate you. I've uh, known you for a while. You gave me the honor of uh, reading one of your books. I think that was Deduct Anything or Everything. Everything. <laughs> And uh, I gave a little blurb for that in, on the back cover of the book. The small business taxes made easy uh, is one that I read constantly, and I uh, I'm a person that highlights things in my books. But I actually need to reach out more to professionals for direct help, you know, and uh, and certainly pay for it. Uh, it's it's worth it. So. Uh, any Thank you so much. I mean, it really, you know, you are such a figure in the industry that people respect and your opinion is important, you know, so people turn to you a lot for guidance in their careers. And I just love um, how with everything going on, you manage to maintain good relations with all kinds of people mm -hmm. and have all these different things going on. And and have avoided some of the nastiness that appears on the internet. I never see any of that stuff on any of your on any of your conversations. And well, I admire I, and I admire that you that you are able to do that. I try to avoid being blatantly political, too religious. Uh, I let people live life on their own terms, you know. And I. Uh, I'm looking, and I turned 64 a few days ago, and I'm looking forward to building a second home in the Philippines and splitting my time between the two continents. And uh, and visiting sort of, my cousin. My cousin just retired there. Ah, uh, I look, and I look forward to helping people. You know, so <laughs> I, I appreciate this uh, this opportunity to present this information to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, and um, let's see who we can help. Sure, and and in the show notes, uh, I'll post the links, any, any uh, resources I mentioned. And uh, yeah, let's see who we can help. Thank you and have a, a wonderful day.